Tonight we're talking about La Dolce Vita with by Fellini with Michael Ventura. So why don't you start us out, Michael? Okay, Brendan. It, first I want to talk about my personal experience of it and then sure. and then the film. Because <clears throat> it came out in nineteen sixty. And the family I was living with, my foster family had moved in the summer to Waterville, Maine. Now, I didn't know this at the time, of course, but I've researched it since. And, and we moved to Waterville at the height of Waterville. In 1960, Waterville had about 18,000 people. That was the height of its population. It was a mill town on the Kennebec River. Uh, there was Colby College up the hill. The lower working class people were French Canadians uh, and they were down the hill and if you lived, if you went to Coburn Classical Institute as I did uh, which was called which was a country day school they used to call and you were living with a Unitarian family the minister's family and, and that was your world you never met a French Canadian, I'm not kidding <laughs> almost never uh, the, the middle class did not associate with them at all. And, and there basically wasn't an upper class. So people ran the town, but they weren't so much richer than, than the well off. <laughs> uh, there was one theater on Main Street. It was called origin, uh, very originally the Main Street. And uh, I imagine all that's boarded up now. I imagine there's a Walmart out of the, outside of town now. I know all uh, uh, Main Street's dead. I know people who've been there and and uh, the, te the school I went to doesn't exist anymore and even the building doesn't exist but at that time it was a thriving New England town uh, nobody could guess the future Why wouldn't Waterville exist 60 years later it was the same thriving town but it does not and and uh, you know, in those days, as I've said, you went to the movies. You didn't go to see a movie. You went to the movies. And uh, you didn't go at a specific time. You just went. Well, it happened that I went when the movie was starting. Alone. I don't know why Carl wasn't with me, but I was alone. Carl was the, the boy in the family who was my age, and he and I got along very well. Uh, he also didn't like the family. <laughs> I didn't like the family. He didn't like the family. Hmm. Uh, but... That shouldn't be something to joke over, but oh well. And I'd never seen a foreign film. I'd never seen subtitles. I was 15. And uh, the beginning of the film, with this helicopter taking this statue of Jesus across, it just, just stunned me. And as things went on in the film, in American films, you don't have a protagonist. Really, you have a hero who is the protagonist. Uh, or a heroine in her way, like uh, Audrey Hepburn in, in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Marilyn Monroe and Jane Russell, et cetera. And, uh, in uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, but here was this hero, protagonist, whom I expected to be, you know, like an American film lead. And he was very confused. And he got more and more and more confused. And the images, I'd never seen photography like that. It was like, when I came out of the film, I knew I was gonna remember this film, like they were my own memories. When Steiner kills his children, first Steiner is represented as this cultured man, and then he kills his children and himself. And the film was treating that somehow sympathetically. If I hadn't been so astonished, I would have screamed at the film because they presented this guy sympathetically. And I was not prepared as an abandoned child <laughs> and surviving with foster parents, I was not prepared 
that uh, to, to to accept that to understand it in any way. And then at the very end, uh, you see the dissolution of Marcello, and that face of that girl who we first seen in the cafe. And, and there's something uplifting suddenly. And, the, and I wasn't aware consciously of the music, but the music takes you in that film, like you're just sweeps you into the scenes. And I think in the running for the best film soundtrack ever, top five, uh, and and the film totally confused me. I left the theater. I didn't know what my reaction was. I really liked the film, but I hated the film. I really was stunned by the photography, but I hated what I was seeing. The scene in the fountain just, wow, I just blew my circuits. And so that was my first impression. Uh, and I knew, I didn't know at the time actually, but, but it was such an impression that whenever a Fellini film came over the next 10 years or so, I had to see it. And more than once. Uh, it, it only played the main street because it had been, some, it won the Academy Award and it, it was, uh, nominated for several other things or it never would have played in Waterville, Maine. No foreign film had played in Waterville, Maine before. I believe it was the first. Also, they were Italians. Now, Sicilians aren't Italians, but uh, they're different in mood and, and range. But they were still, they're still of that culture. And, and uh, they were Roman. And here you see Rome, and Rome is its own culture, the Southern Italy and then there's Rome. Naples, Rome, uh, Florence, they have different cultures. Uh, but it was very familiar to me, the way of talking to each other, all that stuff, the yelling, all that stuff. So, I was very vulnerable to this film, and, and uh, then, then later, you know my story about eight and a half and all that. Uh, but Fellini has remained important to me. And now I can look at that film as uh, as the masterpiece it is. And I don't use that word too often. And I see that the film, you're basically looking at three simultaneous threads that sometimes contradict each other, sometimes support each other. It's almost like the story, <coughs> the story has three protagonists in a way. It has the people in the film, what's going on in the story. That's one current. It has the photography which is unforgettable, and that's another current. And it has the music, which oftentimes completely contradicts the story. Now, it's rare that anybody, in my experience anyway, has used music that way in a film. I've got various Nino you know, Rota soundtracks now, and, and uh, I, I listen to them in themselves. The La Dolce Vita soundtrack has this beautiful, keening trumpet melody. It has this very nervous, fast uh, concoction of melodies. It has this very sweet, String melodies, and and 
when he is really making a point, you'll have that trumpet uh, as though it's returning you to your heart. And you can see things that are terrible, but the music lifts it to somewhere else. So the story ends up being somehow uplifting to an adult. I'm not talking about me when I was a kid. In the story, it's very Dante-esque. It begins with the Christ and then the helicopter of news people coming after the Christ. This, at the time, was still a very Catholic country. It's a Catholic country now in culture. But they say that uh, the churches in Europe are mainly attended by tourists these days. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I haven't been. But certainly in 1960, and certainly the church was not happy with this one in 1960, you have that theme. There's the saints, there's the Jesus on the helicopter, and there's the children who have seen a miracle, and the gaudy coverage of it all, the, the powerlessness of the religion to help the people, to make a difference to the people. You have Steiner who first we see in a church. And he's just written a book on Sanskrit. This is a guy who, <coughs> sorry, this is a guy who is an intellectual, who is cultured, who uh, is, to Marcello, the highest expression of culture. Even though it's Steiner's party, These are supposedly cultured people, but they're boring and they're kind of silly. And you don't really believe that Marcello is writing a novel. You know, Steiner is sincere, clearly, but but uh, his culture doesn't impress upon itself upon Marcello any more than the church does. Into all this, suddenly comes Anita Ekberg. And it's like one of the statues of the goddesses. And she's filmed this way. I mean, it's not an accident that you feel this. One of the statues of the goddesses has come to life and come to Rome. You know, one of those Roman statues come to life to walk the streets, to be a goddess in the 20th century, they go to the fountain. Fountains are holy things. Uh, a fountain in a town meant prosperity, meant survival. Uh, fountains in ancient times were holy places. And she and Marcello cavort, and it's not even really sexual. It is, a goddess is doing this thing Marcello is in no position to understand a, a goddess. A goddess is doing this thing, has visited. It's a visitation. And you're in the theater at home now, watching this visitation and its magic. And all the, all the means of Fulini's great gift are all combined to enchant you in this moment. And it does enchant you. And at the same time, the movie itself is saying, what's the point? What the hell is the point? Yes, it enchants. And then what? Because Marcello doesn't make him a better person. He doesn't know how to do anything with this beauty. And I don't mean that in any kind of vulgar way. How is this beauty affecting him? Is exposure to this beauty mean really anything to him? 
And it's after that, I'm not sure how far after that, that Steiner, to my cello's horror and utter surprise, and to the viewer's utter surprise, if you're seeing that film for the first time, has killed his children. And himself. Why? You can't help but ask why, and there's no answer. It's one of those times when, as my mother used to say, why is a crooked letter. And then my cello is outside the, the, the building, I think, and Steiner's wife and the mother of those children comes home. We don't know where she's been. Maybe we do, but I don't remember for sure. And, and, uh, and so we're just left hanging. We don't really know what happens to her, but her husband and her children are dead, which would be enough if it was an accident, but it's not. So this is a woman destroyed. Her whole purpose in life is destroyed. It also destroys what's left of Marcello's inner life. And yet, and yet, the, the uh, photography is beautiful. The contradiction between what you're watching and what you're seeing and feeling is an intended clash. Before Steiner does this, Marcello is at a cafe somewhere kind of in the countryside. And it's very funny because he's writing a novel in a cafe. He's really, you know, Hemingway corrupted everybody in all over Europe, all over the, all over the Western culture. Novelists have to write in cafes. Hmm. It didn't distract anyway much, but I promise you it distracts most people who try it. And of course I did it at times. Uh, And there's this beautiful Northern Italian looking woman, because I think she's blonde, Paola. And uh, they flirt a little, she's young. She has, no idea about people like Marcello. And he sees her, and the movie is, is intends this, he sees her as a kind of angel. As I'm sure Fellini sees her as a kind of angel. She has nothing to do with what all these other characters are doing. He just sees her in a cafe. They have a little exchange. He's reminded, and he has his novel. He's trying to be an artist. He's reminded of something angelic in the world we don't have to believe she's perfect we don't have to believe any nonsense but she shines with some quality that that the camera loves and that's what we feel the cameras love her after the suicide and murder my cello slides deeper and deeper down the toilet. And we see him uh, and as, uh, time has passed. And uh, we see time has passed. He has gray hair. This is right after the Steiner episode. He has some gray in his hair. He's just still another party. It's even more sordid than the last one. Uh, the parties go, I think there are three or four parties on the film, and each sinks lower in, in interest. Each is more and more and more a party you don't want to be at. The first is just cultured and boring, and then it goes on and on. And... Uh, And he's no longer trying to be a writer. He's in Bewisty. He's given up completely. He's given in. He surrendered to 
his environment. He didn't have the resources. We see his father briefly in exchange with his father. He didn't have the resources. He got educated somehow, but he didn't have the resources, the character, whatever, to resist his own destruction. And he seems content with that. And right at the end, Paula sees him across an estuary. There are, uh, and he sees her. And she recognizes him. He recognizes her. But they can't hear each other. She shouts something. He shouts something back. She shouts something. He, he shouts something. And he shrugs and turns away and goes with his friends. And the last scene, the last shot, is a remarkable shot of her. She's not doing anything special. She is fantastically beautiful. She does evoke an angel as of, a, of an Italian painter in the Renaissance. She does have something about her like that, Botticelli, whatever. And the music comes up. And I think it says, I don't think it says the end. I think the last word, I think what you see at the end of La Dolce Vita. Uh, and the music is contradicting everything. And Paula is there. And what is Fellini saying? Boy, people wrote about this like crazy. Most of it drivel. Uh, and I think... Fellini has said what he has to say about a certain kind of urban culture. And he said what he has to say about both religion and the rejection of religion. Because they, when those children have to say they've seen the Madonna, it's a circus, an vulgar circus, a crass circus. He said what he has to say about uh, wannabe artists, the pretensions of all that. He said what he has to say about a man who can no longer stand to live or see his children grow up in such a world. Uh, and he's so incredibly selfish. So he's not kind enough to kill his wife, too. Uh, I mean, it gets worse the more you think about it. <laughs> and, but it's as though he's saying at the end, there is an angel. Lose your capacity to the audience. Why did I make this film? I made this film to warn you that you can lose your capacity to see the angel. The angel can lose their capacity to hear you. They can't hear you anymore. You get to a place where you can't see them anymore. You can't, even if you see them, you can't make them hear you. They can't hear you. And you're lost. But they're there. Something is angelic in this world. Not in a corny way. Not in a bullshit way. Something is beautiful. Something, it doesn't have to be run. And the music says that. So you're watching this thing, as I said, the story's doing one thing. My cello is going down the toilet in a world that is really unsupportable. Disgusting. The betrayal of everything culture is supposed to be about. That we're taught it's supposed to be about. So he's giving you that. But musically and visually, visually he's giving you this incredible variety of the aliveness and at the same time the the uh, damagedness of post-war Europe. And then with the music, he's giving you uplifting. The music itself is proof of that and it kind of weaves a, weaves a race 
the wrong word I'm looking for. Leaves uh, an atmosphere around Paolo that um, makes you believe the more in feel the more, not believe the more in the angelic. And I'm not using that word in some kind of corny way or even religious way, but it's something in life that can reach out to you and maybe not save you, but uplift you. And it's found more in the young than when people get older, but not only. And to get back to where I started, the story and the music and the visuals interact very consciously on the director's part in such a way that talking about just one of those qualities doesn't get the movie at all. The movie is not the story. The movie is not the music. The movie is not the cinematography. They blend in a way that uh, is full of paradox and sometimes outright contradiction. And it puts Fellini in a class by himself. Uh, Fellini and his collaborators, because he didn't write the movie alone, and and uh, Nino Rota had begun writing his soundtracks, I believe, with La Strada, uh, and would write his soundtracks until Nino Rota died. And the ones who picked up from him would be trying to imitate Nino Rota. Some of them did all right. Uh, so that when you hear the word Fellini, the Fellini film, there's something festive, something dark, all at the same time. So that's what I have on my Dolce Vita. Yeah, I think. Reminded me how much I love this film. That uh, it's good to remember that four guys wrote this movie, um, and that everything in this everything in this film means something, though it seems uh, all over the place. It's it has very specific themes, and I I think that the main theme with the with the character of Marcello is is uh, obviously his descent. Um, into uh, sensuality, um, but I, I think that every every character in this movie, or at least the three three of the main characters, or four actually of the main characters, represent different um, represent di- different aspects of Europe at at the uh, in the post war period. So I think Marcello represents the Italian man and the the choices that he is being confronted with. I think Steiner represents Germany and the the choices that uh, and and the and and the identity um the identity problems of the uh of all of them but but especially of Steiner um and I'll get into that but uh and then his Marcello's girlfriend represents the uh a traditional Italian woman right and she really yes. she really yeah. gets into that when they go to the party and she sees the children and and uh it really solidifies that that image of her as as the 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 down to earth traditional Italian woman and then there's the other woman I forget her name. Who is the the kind of bourgeois woman that he goes to the the uh, the prostitute's house with and everything? And she represents the kind of new or bourgeois Italian woman. Um, there's kind of a a choice there or a mirror there between those two women and uh, a choice of of which ways is, is the woman gonna go? Um, the Italian woman, and then uh, you have Marcello's father. Who shows up and uh, and and he represents the the old Italian man and he can't keep up right he goes back to the girl's house and he right. he almost has a heart attack right but so yes. as far as as uh, the the way 
it another giant aspect of this movie is the 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 religious aspect and the catholicism aspect and um what's going on with with the catholic church with the roman catholic church when this movie comes out what is the the big thing that is occurring in the church right then the second vatican council is in preparation right right so it it opens up with marcello in one helicopter and then and then jesus being carried by another helicopter and marcello is, is following that helicopter right he's like following he's pursuing jesus um loftily up here in the in the sky but he he's he's distracted right by sensuality those women sunbathing right. on the on the roof right so right from the start yes, right. <laughs> right from the start he is he's uh straying from the path right and then um and he's trying to get their number yeah he's trying to get their number, and they don't give it to him right um no <laughs> and uh so right from the start that that theme is is kind of there where he's here's a man who you know he starts off in the air in these lofty pursuits and and uh and slowly and it's really through a seven seven stages there's really like seven episodes in this and and by the seventh one he's just in total uh degradation in a sense but uh really one of the key scenes i think is uh he's he's doing some kind of photo shoot or some kind of ridiculous photo shoot with a horse and on a table or something out in a in a square right and uh but then for some reason his attention is called to to uh to this cathedral and the cathedral is this extremely brutalist cathedral where it's just you know a, a big cement wall and then the the saints are kind of placed in this in this wall so it's a very modernist cathedral right and um and so he he's drawn to it and he goes in there and uh and who's in there is is steiner the german guy and also the priest the priest is german too and and if you look at um if you look at this the the uh if you look at vatican ii the um almost the entire reform there was a reform group and then there was a conservative group right and the conservative group was made up um almost all italians the the reform group the theologians and and the and most of the bishops of the reform group were all either uh german or austrian and one of the uh one of the uh and ratzinger is one of them the guy who becomes a uh, pope benedict but um yeah. so he's they're definitely alluding when when he goes into that cathedral they're alluding to the fact of the 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 german wing of this reform movement within vatican ii um and he's steiner has the for some reason he has the sanskrit book and he makes a, a point of showing him the sanskrit book which it could go off on a, a tangent about that but then right from the right from the start you get this feeling with steiner where there's there's uh that there there's an artifice about steiner and and he's uncomfortable with it and there's a part where um he starts playing the organ in the cathedral at first he's playing a jazz song and then he starts playing bach and um and you see marcello become very uncomfortable it's not really explained why he's uncomfortable and he actually ducks out while while steiner is playing the uh <laughs> the organ and uh yep. so then he he goes and and i think that the 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 kind of uh the surface explanation for why steiner kills his children is that he he gives that little talk to marcello on on the deck at um at the party where he says that uh he he has a conflict over either being with his family um that he feels restrained by the family life right um and yes. and i think that that's that's he has, he has a conflict about money yeah and and i think that that's a very like elementary way of looking at why he kills the the children um i think there's something deeper there um where where he i think that there is I think that they're they're making a parallel to um to 
to Adolf Hitler in a way where he's the father that uh, that kills his children, right? They look at him as a as a father, and he ends up killing his children. But there's also this identity problem with Steiner that's that's uh, that's going on in Germany that where they. They, they're unsure of their identity now and um, they're trying to find their identity and there's there's always this kind of artifice that that they're aware of where they're, they're putting on a face um, because there was this whole aspect that they celebrated during the Third Reich and now they have to deny it right and um, and there's that part at the party where he's playing the uh, he's playing the, the the recordings of the the wild animals right? And it, mm-hmm. and in a weird way, it's like the, they're not real wild animals. It's not the real thing. It's 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 recordings of that, right? Like there's always right. this right. this uncomfortable artifice about who Steiner is and his how genuine he can be and everything, right? But uh, mm-hmm. and you're right about the parties becoming more and more uh, sensual and and uh sinful or whatever like the first party with steiner the you could kind of compare it to like the folk movement in the in the in america yeah, right like yeah. kind of pete right, seeger right. type people and everything right they they have a hopeful <laughs> kind of uh kind of a dedication to to hope and beauty and everything right like they haven't totally degenerated themselves um so uh yeah, he keeps he keeps going and he goes through the thing with his father and and uh, and shows that and everything and then and then he's and then by the end he's he's totally just gotten into this this scene where he's a total prostitute now you know he's just doing whatever is being told to him to make money he's writing anything and and. Uh, and um, he's just basically like a media prostitute, and he's surrounded by uh, transvestites, and and uh, people are just—it's just kind of an empty party scene that has no substance. And um, and then they they end up on the beach with a carcass of this totally grotesque, uh, right, right. whatever it is, man, like a ray or yeah, some kind of that. bizarre fish or something like that. Um, and I guess what they were alluding to a little bit in that was there was a famous murder case or a, or a death that happened around uh, 1959 where this aspiring actress um, was found dead on the beach in Italy. Um, and uh, and they never really figured out like how she died or anything, but the press went wild on it and tried to say that she had been involved in some kind of uh, upper-class orgy or something like that. Um mm-hmm. But it kind of represents like all these people go to this beautiful beach and then and then they they just have this rotting carcass there, right? But um, right. he uh, and then there's that character of the of the innocent girl, and he's divided from that girl by that kind of a river going into the sea, yeah. and and um, and she represents uh, this uh, this purity obviously I mean that's a real obvious analogy where he's just he's just become this kind of soiled person he's he uh, Italy Italy has this this choice or maybe they don't really have a choice they're just kind of just overwhelmed with uh, with this this kind of uh, almost media assault on them of of uh, of cheap tabloid media and and um sensual films and everything and that's really i think what the the whole uh who is it anita eckberg or or um is that right is that the the actress the blonde actress that comes anita eckberg yeah Yeah. so she shows up um that whole thing which um i mean it seems like kind of an obvious analogy of 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 uh hollywood coming there and uh and they're all falling all over themselves to to uh to idolize this uh this hollywood star and uh and this kind of uh degenerate scene that that they're bringing there and that party is also kind of awful too you know and and uh and and then she draws him 
into the water she draws him into the fountain like kind of drawing him into more and more sensuality right and um but he still he doesn't uh he doesn't give into it really yet and the whole time he's also he keeps thinking about his the his girlfriend you know the traditional right, italian woman right. he's he's calling her when the when the one girl uh when the one girl takes him to the prostitute he calls her and it ends up that she's od'd and then like he keeps like uh going and coming from her and he even like does it very graphically where he he dumps her on the side of the road and then right, leaves right, right. and then comes back to her you know and he keeps he's he's going back and forth as the movie goes on you know he's 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 going and there's this whole i think there's a whole analogy there about okay you know during mussolini or the pre-war years there was this kind of enforced traditional catholic uh right. italy where it's it's very stratified and it's being enforced on you and it's really suffocating and and uh and and uh kind of awful you know like you don't you don't have any choice in it you have to participate yep. in this in this kind of synthetic you know what it means to be italian nationalism thing but right, uh right. now they've got all this freedom and but they're being now they're being enslaved by their own uh libidos right so i think that yep. that's part of a you know it's Marcello, as the Italian man right now, has this uh, this conflict going on where, you know, his father has has not been able to deal with what's going on with the with the sensuality. He physically can't <laughs> keep up with it, and uh, and um, Marcello has kind of just had this avalanche of of uh, of dealing you know all this new stuff that the you know the marshall plan is brought in and and all these new uh right. all this kind of uh synthetic prosperity and everything and uh really the street scenes are are just incredible and obviously the the whole i mean we could go on and on about the whole making of it and the the visuals and everything um one thing that i really noticed was he must have seen touch of evil and gotten very influenced by that because I, I think that I saw so much of Touch of Evil in in uh, in this movie, especially the street You're right. scenes. You're right. Um, That's very good. You're right. And uh, yeah. So uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you could just it it's it's a very beautiful movie, and and um, you could just Touch get, of Evil get, is a lady get, from Shanghai. Yeah, I haven't seen so the lady. The lighting, lady, the lot from like lady from Shanghai. Yeah, I think he was very influenced by uh, by Orson Welles. Um, Orson, Orson Welles, yeah. Um, especially for this. I mean, in, the street in scenes. In Citizen Kane, you get some of those visual rhythms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the rhythm uh, of it, that, for that, sure. That, yeah. 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 I mean, the street I scenes are are yeah. just amazing. I, I mean, the whole uh, orchestration of, of that with the cars and the walking and and I mean, it just must have right. been extremely complex and and uh, yeah. So I think um, there's a bunch of different stuff going on, and and it would be easy to say, oh, they just threw a bunch of stuff at the wall and, and to see what was what would happen and, and no, everything. But it's precise. definitely, it's, it's very, very, the, the, technically it's very precise. And also the, the story is very, very, very precise. And it's very deep. It's yes. not, it's not, um, it's not surface level at all. Like it, it, it really is a heartfelt um, kind of, uh, um, owed to to the the conflict of of uh post-war man of especially these two losing countries right like yes. what does yes. germany do and and what does does italy do and and what do these young people what what path do these young people take now and it, and it shows you all these different paths and all these different opportunities and all these different obstacles and um things that they they like they can't avoid, you know, like if they want to survive, they, they have to take part and compromise themselves. And, and how much do you compromise yourself? How little do you compromise yourself? Um, right. And, and, right. uh, and it's also a giant indictment of, of the, uh, 
of the media, I think, too, where, I mean, the the name paparazzi comes from that character yeah. in, in the movie, right? The yeah. paparazzo guy. But, uh, but, but it, and, and that's the first time, yeah, I was thinking that, too, when I, when I saw the movie again. Yeah, uh, yeah. This. Uh, oh yeah you coined a word for me yeah 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 you, you, you guys coined a word that doesn't happen every day yeah but the, the yeah, that's a worldwide word i think i think the, the scene that really kind of kicks you in the heart is when the steiner's wife gets off the bus and exactly. the the media surrounds her the paparazzi surrounds her and she's you know, uh, flattered and happy that, you know, oh, what's what's going yeah. on? You know, like, all of a sudden, I'm a movie star, right? And that's just, like, right, right. so freaking heartbreaking, you know? I mean, that's got to be yeah. one of the most heartbreaking scenes in, in all of cinema. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, you, you took me, I must have seen Eight and a Half in La Strada and Juliet of the Spirits, like, Ten yeah. times each as a kid, <laughs> because every time they showed it, like you would take me right, but you would never take me to see La Dolce Vita, right? And um, that's right. And I understand, <laughs> I understand why. You know, it's like that. Um, that's just a really brutal and and traumatic scene. Um, and uh, yes, yes. And and that whole episode with Steiner, I mean, it and that really shows the that it's it's. Uh, it's a very deep film and um and the way that he films that that scene too um is just uh mm -hmm. yeah it really gets to you but uh yeah there's a million different things that you could go into in this film but uh i think uh, from a from a, a distant standpoint that it's a it's a seven stage descent of of marcello um at least yes. for for that character Definitely. um but you you have this uh, this um, constant angel or or hope um, mm -hmm. that doesn't stop smiling when when Marcello walks away from her, right? No, exactly. he continue, <laughs> continues exactly. to smile, right? So like Fellini always yeah. does, he never leaves you just totally in the mud, right? He uh, no, he has that that uh, that that kind of constancy of of hope all the time no matter how dire thing, yeah. things get in the in the yeah. movie right and it's funny too because in the first scene that you see that blonde girl and marcello says to her he says you know you should uh go and and be a model or i have a friend who who can you know take pictures of you or something like that and she just kind of blows it off right like it doesn't mean anything yeah. to, to her right? <laughs> so she really is uh it's so subtle you know and it's so beautiful some of the things are so subtle in it and and uh that what and especially that you know it takes a a a, a a trained eye to to be able to notice that you know just the way that that she um kind of blows off the the uh the right. sensuality and and she's stays not, hopeful she's not impressed. yeah she remembers right. yeah yeah she, she remembers, remembers <laughs> later but she's yeah. not she's yeah. not uh, uh in the least uh like impressed you know she's just, he's a guy at the cafe yeah and and uh, and he's trying to impress her a little. And no, not that way. That's not the way you impress me, Mister. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vendor said, "Once America has colonized our imaginations." Yeah. And I think uh, that's, that's part of what you mean. I think by this uh, this media invasion, because it it comes from America, basically. Yeah. Well, it was it was very specific, man. I mean, it they you know it was a very specific uh, to uh, the reason they said was to to you know kind of show the show Moscow that they could be um, they could have some kind of artistic independence and not be a totalitarian state where they're telling artists what to do and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, who knows what the what the real intentions were? But uh, that was a very big part of the Marshall Plan, and and they they had yeah. a lot of money behind that cultural influence. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, 
Yeah, it's uh, and you know Mastroianni is uh, always wonderful and and uh, yeah, good movie. Yeah, he's un- he's kind of uncanny. He's one of these actors right. who yeah, uh, you don't really s- you can't watch him act. You know, right. you, you can't catch him at it. Uh, he embodies what he's portraying so completely. Right, he's like a, he's kind of like Alain Delon. He's a better Alain Delon, but uh, it's effortless, right? It's uh, yes, just yes. being being themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right. That was a it's a good little episode about La Dolce Vita. Maybe we should do eight and a half sometime too. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs>